Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Maynard Orm, who's the president and CEO of Oregon Public Broadcasting, who will introduce Dr. Philip Morrison. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Thank you. It seems strange to introduce somebody who's already on stage, but what the heck, we'll do it. Um, hope you're all going to have a good evening tonight. I suspect we will. Uh, the work of humanitarian educator and brilliant theoretical Philip, uh, physicist Dr. Philip Morrison has ranged across the frontiers of advanced science to include nuclear reactions, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, high energy astrophysics, and cosmology. Dr. Morrison has hosted several public broadcasting documentaries, ta-da, including the highly acclaimed six-part series, The Ring of Truth. He is the co-author of a fundamental textbook on nuclear physics with Ray Ames and Phyllis Morrison uh, called Powers of Ten, a book which demonstrates through amazing imagery and spatial techniques the relative size of things in the universe. His latest work, a collection of essays entitled Nothing is Too Wonderful to be True, has just been published. During World War II, Morrison worked at the University of Chicago on the Manhattan Project to develop the first nuclear bomb. He is the longtime book review editor for Scientific American and Emeritus Professor of Physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Please join me in giving a warm Portland welcome to the eminent physicist Dr. Philip Morrison. Thank you very much. I'm grateful both to the audience and to the eloquent procession of introducers, and I think we have an interesting evening. Gravity Calls the Cosmic Tune is the title, and I would like to call a tune on my own. I wonder if we can have that. There are two, two pairs that I'm going to begin by talking about. My talk is rooted in these two pairs. The first pair is off stage behind, as we think. It is the pair Shakespeare Galileo. Two enormous Renaissance figures, one at the very end of the Italian Renaissance, one at the high flower of the English Renaissance, but appearing at the same time, same chronological time, as the change of the minds of Europe spread from Central Europe to the West. It was in that century which began with Galileo, Gilbert, Shakespeare, that what we call contemporary science began. All the symptoms point to that. Of course, there are, there are forerunners. Bry was a little earlier. There's Gilbert at the very hinge. There's Kepler and the rest. And by the beginning of the next century, the other century turn, as we are at a century turn, give or take a few years from the uh, chronological date of the century, uh, another pair appear very much in the relationship which can be described. Galileo was the younger of the pair, Shakespeare the older. Galileo, Shakespeare's work was probably not very well known to Galileo. Though, of course, Galileo did meet with Milton, a successor to Shakespeare, in person uh, 10 or 20 years uh, after the death of the, the greatest playwright. The other pair was reversed. Bach was the younger man, Jonathan, Johann Sebastian Bach, and Isaac Newton, the older. But they had some interaction, not face to face, not viva voce like that. But we are pretty sure that in Sh Newton's second career, I'll describe why he had two and how he had two, Bach, then in the prime of his life as, as an inter instrumental composer, uh, producing the Brandenburg concertos, excelled in the music of the viol, as it was called. And we have Mr. Newton's own statement that he enjoyed the viol concerts very much in London. It's quite likely that he began with this kind of music. Before that, though, he was a very different man. He had two careers. His first career was a, almost a recluse of science and learning. He was an extraordinary scholar in books, in laboratories, 
at the telescope, grinding mirrors in many ways, but he had very little contact with fellow men. The university was formally present, but actually in ruin. The British, the English Civil War had very much brought Cambridge to its knees because its uh, strong partisan behavior had uh, caused many uh, hardships to the scholars and the students. Students were not there very much. Lectures were irregular. Lectures were announced, written down, but never given. When they were given, they were often not attended. The whole thing was based in very curious uh, uh, formality. But Newton persevered and managed decade by decade to produce some of the most important works of that century. And by the time of the 1680s, though he was not someone you would see in, the, in London or in, at the, in any of the social occasions, he was reckoned as a mathematical power and a man who knew as well the classical literature and the foundations of chemistry. And so the three most effervescent minds of the newly founded Royal Society, Hooke, Wren, and Halley, debating on the nature of the orbits of the planets that the French and Dutch philosophers were writing about, thought they ought to consult Mr. Newton before they got, went too far, because Mr. Newton might well know something would help them. And the famous story goes when, when Halley went to see Newton, it was not easy to arrange the appointment, he could do so, Newton was willing to see him. Uh, he asked Newton the central question about the ellipse and uh, what, is the, what is the orbital form of a body that orbits according to a certain law of force and uh, Newton said, why of course the ellipse and how do you know Mr. Newton said Halley and Halley said, why sir, I have calculated it and so he had. He couldn't find the calculation though, so <laughs> which throws a slight doubt on the, uh, the issue. But in a few years, he produced his great book, uh, six or eight hundred pages of calculation, and that was enough for everybody. And it, it, changed, it changed his fortunes completely. And after a short time, he became so celebrated that he was a governmental caliber. He got a classy civil service job as master of the mint. It was not a sinecure, but it was a very posh job. And he went to London and became, no longer did much in the scientific way, though he was still able, as he showed by solving certain puzzles, but uh, enjoyed himself more and spoke to society and generally relished in the enormous uh, uh, celebrity that had been given to him, especially by the English uh, public, who felt that he was their ornament and wrote so very floridly in the Baroque style of the time. So that was his second career, and in that career I feel it's quite clear that he interacted with Mr. Bach, at least in this remote way that we can too. Now, m some people like to think, and I would like to agree with them, but I, I couldn't really in conscience, objectively, that Bach's music is itself universal. I doubt that it is. I think on earth you find many people who would not react to it as the aficionados do, and that's true for all forms of music. Music is a cultural affair. But something about Newton's gravitation has so enormously changed and enriched in these years since 1700, which I may call the center of its publication, that that's what I wanted to talk about. Not only what it means, not only how much it calls the cosmic tune, but in how many different ways it has appeared, the same ideas, the same formulation, even the same numerical and physical formulae apply in such different contexts with such different consequences that I regard it as an absolute pattern for what uh, physical principles in the great play of nature, far more varied than any textbook or any set of problems or any uh, characteristic paradigm can uh, hope to hold. And that's what has happened to Newton. So I'd like to say a little bit about it, and I think the first, the first slide would be worthwhile looking at. I have it. This is a nice slide because, of course, nothing but an ellipse drawn rather simply. But notice, by the way, that it's heavy with letters. If I saw a student's paper with that many letters on an ellipse, I would shake my head because it would be very difficult to do enough calculations to justify all that notation. 
<laughs> but not for Newton. He made plenty of calculations. I'm sure that every letter there, though well, I haven't checked it, is really uh, verified. I hope it's true. But there's the ellipse, and we all know that Newton announced and spread around the world with the concrete results for the entire structure, the approximate structure of the solar system as then known, a universal force of attraction. And this, of course, struck everyone in a storm. People are looking for universals. We still look for universals. I said universal music, in my view, probably does not exist. If it is, it's in the Allegro of Concerto I, but I don't think it's that universal. <laughs> And uh, uh, on the other hand, gravity seems to be, though at the end I will show you it's not exactly as simply universal as we thought, uh, pretty close to the most universal pervasive d description that we have of any part of the physical world. Now, if it is universal, the first question has to be asked. I was surprised when I was reading up on this. I found that not many critics complained about this, but some did. And Newton himself recognized the problem. And in a book that wasn't published until after his death, his, an English version of his Latin book, The System of the World, which was a small part of the big book, the less mathematical part, the part with more applications than he expected, and indeed when it came out, it succeeded in attracting the attention of many, many readers far outside the mathematical, geometrical, astronomical community. Is this question, if it's universal, why do not my fists attract each other? Why does not one orange roll toward another? Why does not one book creep across the desk to the other book? If there's universal attraction and all matter per, uh, contains it, that does seem to be a question. And it is a question, it's a very important question, because testing such general statements by the methods of physics is one of the, most, the best ways of pedagogy, of understanding what's going on. And of course, the answer is quite plain. He says, the attraction is there, but it is so small that the circumstances of everyday life, the friction, the lack of perfect horizontality, etc., prevents you from observing it. Merely the patience to watch the motion is bad. The air currents, everything else has done that. But if that is true, then it is, it is really responsibility for the physicist to do something better than that, and they very soon did. Of course, I do uh, comment to begin with, gravitation is a very weak force per atom. Because with very few ions that are not even sparking, just rubbing a little cat's fur on a piece of glass, as they did in the 17th century, is enough to make plenty of things rise in the air, a paper run up to the cat's fur entirely against the pool of the Earth, which has plenty of atoms pulling the other way. So a small amount of electric charge appears to overcome an enormous amount of gravity, judged by the size of the physical sources of the two forces. And we believe that today, and can put it more quantitatively, if you like the quantity, certainly atom for atom, the electromagnetic forces which hold matter together, keep it strong, keep it from being compressed, all the features of matter that are mechanical uh, are about a billion billion, or really a hundred billion billion stronger atom for atom, 10 to the 20th, than the forces of gravitation. Obeying the same rule of dilution with distance, the inverse square law. So if it's true at one distance, it's true at all distances. So how then can this tiny force manage to be the central force which calls the tune in the language that I chose, which of course Newton recognized from his, what we would now say, provincial understanding of the solar system and the few fixed stars outside. Answer, of course, is, is pretty clear. The answer is that it's weak, but it it's unrelenting. It grows as it works. It is self-reinforcing because when you add matter to matter, the total matter present grows and therefore is more attractive for the next bunch of matter. But if I add charge to charge, if the charges are like, they repel each other and they can't be added easily. If the charges are unlike, they attract, but then the total is smaller than the, what you began with, and therefore charges saturate. They dominate the atom where there's nothing in between, it's only charged particles. A few of them, when they come in mass, they don't uh, work over a great distance at all. And that is why matter has its nature and why gravitation is so different. But gravitation, since it is very weak, but adds with every atom, can continue to grow as long as you have more matter present. And I'll show that in a conspicuous way quite soon. Now, it didn't take very long for the physicists to understand that this general question that I raised, if it's universal, 
and universal in the sense the sun attracted all the planets, and the planets attracted their moons, and the moon attracted the water of the earth to make the tides, that was all very good, and allowed the inference of universality, but it still failed to convince a true skeptic who said, well, the apples don't roll together, I don't understand what you're saying. And we have to show that in some form. Now, of course, it's very hard because what I've said is clear. Since it's weak, I must use big things to demonstrate the presence of this force. So to use big things, it turns out that to go from the whole Earth, which was clear, but maybe we don't see the center of the Earth. Maybe there's some mysterious matter in there which acts on other astronomical objects, but not every piece of matter. That's, uh, un that's ugly and spoils the universality, but it's a plausible theory. So here's what you do next, and there you recognize what you do next. You have a mountain, and on each side of the mountain you hang a plumb bob, which is supposed to hang downwards towards the center of the great round earth, which certainly supplies most of the gravity. We all agree on that. But since the mountain is present, the matter in the mountain will also have a little bit of gravity and deflect the pendulum a little bit its, 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 its own way. And so you see the two pendulums, plumb bobs if you like, pointing not vertical, but a little bit towards the mountain. So therefore, if we can be so clever as to measure that tilt by measuring the vertical on two sides of a mountain to see if it's the same or if in fact they're oppositely deflected as it shows there, we'll have an answer. And indeed, that was done. And here is the apparatus. In a modern artist's version of a 17th century uh, drawing, notice the uh, Newtonian-looking gentleman is Mr. Maskeline, I think, for the Royal Observatory. Notice his brass work, that beautiful instrument, the key to the whole development, as everyone knows, whoever collects instruments or goes through the museums, is all that beautiful, fine mechanical work of hand and mind, which calibrated the scales and polished the uh, lenses and did all those things that mean precision, good measurement in physics, and did not exist 200 years before that. The technology, a clear part of the development. So you see the general idea, there's the plumb bob hanging there, and looking through a, a telescope, against the plumb bob, measuring the position of a star which transits above the telescope, not perfectly through zenith, so it must have a little bit of motion back and forth to catch the stars that are not carefully adjusted to pass over Greenwich Observatory. So it had to be done that way. And then by measuring the arc, you get the deflection of the star from the zenith, and you could test that clearly if you're hard working by taking this telescope first to one side of a mountain, then to the other side of the mountain, comparing the distances, do this for hundreds of stars, which they did, and you'll get some effect, and that was the effect which was done. And it was done on this mountain, Mr. Maskelyne, in the 1770s. There's the, the mountain. You see this wonderful fuzzy mountain looking like some sort of a bug, I hasten to say. Shehalian, it's not. It's a beautiful ridge in the Scottish Highlands. You see, it's a narrow ridge, just what you want. You don't have to go too far, because, of course, you go too far, you have differences of timing. It has to be taken into account. So this is what they did, and they indeed found the, the correct result. That is, they found a clear result which agreed with the theory of Mr. Newton, except, of course, they didn't know exactly what the mountain was made of. So they carefully geologized all around the place, but they couldn't afford to drill holes right through the mountain and do a real job, so they only get a rough result, which might be 20% off or something, and they understood that, a very reasonable approach to this very difficult problem. So it was universal. It was about a mountain is a couple of miles of rock, and the Earth is about 10,000 miles of rock. So taking that crude view, and the calculations show it should be proportional to that linear size, it turns out you get about one ten thousandth of the circle difference from the two sides of the mountain, about 10 or 20 seconds, that's exactly what, of arc, and that's exactly what they found, which was very nice and satisfied everybody, that at least all the stuff of the Earth was part of Newtonian's, uh, Newtonian universal gravitation. Now, that's only the Earth and the planets and the sun, and that's pretty good. But the, the next step, in my view, was made by a very little-known French observer, uh, Félix Savary, about uh, 1825, after the death of Newton and Maskelyne and all these people, still interested in this problem. He was the first who found patiently an elliptical orbit for two stars that were double stars physically gravitating one about the other, orbiting one about the other. While he didn't live long enough to follow the whole of an orbit, that's a long time, the star was Mizar, the star in the handle of the dipper, 
he did follow it enough to get a very good fit of an ellipse and assuming that the stars were about the mass of the sun it all worked out quite well so this is again a good collection so it was universal to the stars as well of course now we have traced it out to the ends of our experience still not perfectly there are still some problems uh, most people think those problems will lie elsewhere and I do too but I'll come at the end of talking about the problems still remain Mizar, by the way, is that star which is used as an eye test for people. If you can handle the dipper on a clear night, if you can ever see a clear night, uh, you will see that the, besides the handle of the dipper, there's a little, in the middle of the dipper handle, there's a second star very, very close to the star which is properly part of the handle. That is not part of a double star, that is simply an accidental superposition. But it's, it's considered a test for the eyes, and most every young person can see it and you'll see that easily but the real double to Mizar is much closer and invisible inside the light of Mizar without telescopic aid but it's nice to point it out that way so that was the first time that gravity was quantitatively pushed outside the solar system and I think it's a landmark which ought to be remembered better than it is and you don't find Mr. Savary even in the big encyclopedias of the history of science now there's a much stronger and I think a more apparent way to understand uh, the next effect of gravity and the one that I'm talking about that size it grows with size and that's to look at the structure of the things of the that are big now we don't see things that are big on earth we do see mountains we've talked about that we do see earth as a whole we know about that the earth as a whole as you all know is essentially a sphere slightly flattened due to rotation already pointed out by Newton as a deviation from the sphericity that pure gravity which is a spherical force would produce if it simply crushes everything down as tight as it can of course it doesn't do it perfectly because on small scale matter is too strong matter can resist but make enough matter and that has to give up therefore an easy conclusion is possible objects that are and you can make the calculations uh, larger than than uh, 100 or 200 miles across are going to be spherical if objects are distinctly smaller are going to be lumps like bricks or pieces of charcoal whatever you have in mind because gravity is not strong enough to overcome the terrible strong force of the electric fields in matter and there isn't enough atoms of gra uh, giving gravity to help so that's what happens and you recognize the familiar pictures this is a time sequence taken by the wonderful satellite Galileo a year or so ago approaching the asteroid Gaspra they saw Gaspra up in the upper left hand corner this is a time sequence in it comes and it comes again and in it comes again and there it's pretty big and you better duck and the, the satellite was well done it did duck and here's a good picture of it without the rest of the history and there's no doubt about it that's an astronomical object it's 60 or 80 miles long you can see the pits the craters in it where it had collisions like the surface of the moon and the shadow of course hides much of it but you can see it's nothing like a sphere so fine that's good gravity is not strong enough to crush that into a sphere but look at this that's a thousand mile object one of the moons of Jupiter this is a three thousand mile object the planet Mars I'm just calling your attention to their obvious sphericity beautiful sphericity and this is an even more remarkable object this of course is the giant platter planet Saturn seen from the other side we never see it this way only Voyager can see it this way and it shows the shadow being cast behind and the shadow cast clearly on the very flat plane of the disk and I show the sphere in the disk to remind you of the two pieces of gravitation that we're familiar with the sphere being the collection of matter into that irresistible sphere because gravity pulls in all directions equally and the best way to adjust then is to make yourself spherical and anything that's not strong enough we pull down into it if it's strong enough which means small enough it can remain as a bump on the surface and that's the situation now what's the plane the plane is a ring of orbits an orbit is just a, lies in a plane that's another rule of gravity there will be a plane orbit around a spherical object and if there are many plane orbits they have to lie in a in a plane and of course if you start them in another plane you can fill up the whole space eventually but if you st just look at the beginning you'll find and there are some reasons we know that things will tend to go into a plane if there's a random introduction of material this plane of the rings 
is very, very thin, only a few miles thick, and it's uh, half a million miles across, so it's an extremely thin pancake indeed. And we know it's made of fragments, uh, it's not, not to discuss that today, but that's the sort of thing that it is. It's a nice picture to keep in mind. Now, where's the ellipse in all this? I haven't said much about the ellipse, and of course the ellipse is the thing that the theory suggests requires that a generalized ellipse be the shape of an orbit of every object that is orbiting around the influence in the field of, we would say, a single large object. No matter what the size of the planet, as long as the planet is not, uh, is not very big compared to the object. Now, of course, that's a special case, and it's an interesting case which occurs very much for us, but it's interesting to look at a few examples because we have a very bad misunderstanding of the real situation. That's to say the circumstances that are the fact, not just the textbook theories, and I was lacking in this understanding, though I taught it for many years. Danger, don't believe all you're told. And uh, here's it. This is an honest drawing to scale, the best that my wife, who is a good artist, and I could do, using the computer to lay it out, and then carefully drawing by pencil, so he put the hand element into it a little bit. This is the orbit of the Earth, to scale. Now, it's not an ellipse, right? Well, it's, as far as you can tell, if you measure the radii in all directions, the center is marked there with a black dot. What do you think that red dot is? What's sort of near the center of the radius of the Earth, of the orbit of the Earth? It's the Sun. The reason that we speak of this as not a circle is plain. The Sun does not lie in the center. The Sun lies in one of the focus foci of the ellipse. But the ellipse is so close to a real circle that the width of the pencil line is not adequate to show this difference. The two axes differ by about one part in 4,000 and nobody can do pencil draftsmanship that well as far as I know. Of course you could do it on a big scale on mylar and maybe you could do it but it's very difficult. But so accurate are the minute of arc measurements of the astronomers and even the second of arc measurements that after thousands and thousands and thousands of observations they can tell you numerically what it is but they couldn't draw it that way and nobody wants them to but that's the situation. <laughs> so but I observed that an ellipse is only a matter of speaking, right? And I think this is quite valuable because we should keep these things in mind. All we talk about generally, especially we try to do it fast in textbooks or in lectures, I fear, is to make approximations. It's wise to make them, indispensable for science, but it's also wise not to overlook them. And that's what I'm trying to bring that out in this sense. So there we have this uh, rather nice uh, effect. Well, of course, when I tell you that the Earth's orbit is an ellipse, and I say, well, it's really very close to a circle. You're happy about that. Uh, Mars is more eccentric, and Pluto very much more eccentric, even tilted out of the plane. Uh, we could do a lot more, but that's another story. That's the geography story. But let's look at the next picture. I'm going deliberately to exaggerate everything about the Earth's orbit in order to make a point. This is not a real picture of the Earth's orbit. It's a diagram of the Earth's orbit. It's the kind of thing you see in textbooks all the time. It has a function, but I'm just trying to be honest about it. The Earth moves in ellipse, which is very like a circle, but here I've greatly exaggerated the major axis and greatly squashed the minor axis, so I show you it's an ellipse. It's not an ellipse like that, but it is one of that class of functions, so that's okay. And it goes round and round. But notice, it's not an ellipse at all. If I ask an honest person with an artistic eye what I have drawn there, I suspect that she would say, it's perhaps a rosette that you're trying to draw. I think that's the term for this kind of, of figure. Does anybody have a better term for that? Now, why is that? Well, there are many reasons, but the most interesting reason is the following. The Earth and the Sun are not alone in the universe. And indeed, the other planets are quite important. And one of the other planets has more mass than all the others put together. Even though it only has one two thousandth, all of them put together have only the two, one two thousandth part of the mass of the Sun. So we live in a very disproportionate world for mass. The mass is all in the sun. We are creatures of the sun. Small fragments of the same material that makes the sun. You know, all that sort of thing, but it's nice to see it uh, realized in this way. And the effect of that is very easy to believe without doing any equations. I think I can convince you that it's the practical thing to believe. If I say that a thing moves in an ellipse, or a circle, which is a kind of ellipse, a special case, I say, well, I start here, imagine this tiny little point starting here, moves round and round and round, finally gets around. 
Where must it go if it's to complete the circle? It must go right to the very point where it started. It won't do to go near that point. If you go near that point, you get a rosette. You get a repeated ellipse that constantly shifts, or as they say, precesses or retrocesses, either way, whichever way you go, uh, a little bit around the axis shifts as you go around. Of course that's the real orbit of the Earth to this approximation, because the Earth is not alone. And as it moves, Jupiter is moving too. And there's no precondition, they must go together in a certain way. So by the time the Earth goes around one year, Jupiter's gone around uh, a uh, twelfth of its orbit, it's in a different position, it pulls a little bit, and so that perfect match which an isolated Earth might make around an isolated Sun is not going to work ever. It's going to be close, but no cigar, no orbit closure. The orbit is never closed. No two-dimensional figure in a three-dimensional space can ever be closed unless some happy accident or some exquisite attention by the experimenter or most likely some neglect of something interesting by the theorist have taken place. <laughs> there just isn't any other way. You can't come back and find that point. Anyway, some mathematicians, uh, mathematical uh, uh, background will recognize it's a set of measure zero to find that point. You'll never find that point, especially if you start measuring, you know, really carefully. So, uh, all right, so that's the way it goes. You say, well, these are trivial things. Now, they are small, and in fact, that's the burden of my entire talk, is really that uh, issue, that what we did with Newton for the first 200 and plus years was make minor, trivial, I wouldn't quite say trivial, minor, uh, elegant corrections to the great work by taking into account smaller and smaller details to see if it all held together, and it held together very, very well, with a couple of exceptions. You know, one of those details was trying to fit the orbit of, of uh, Uranus, and it couldn't be done. And they invented Neptune to <laughs> take care of the difficulties. And lo and behold, they found Neptune, which is really very good and was one of the greatest uh, accomplishments. In the same way, the orbit of the comets were not understood, and it was realized by Halley that they had to be ellipses just like uh, Newton's law said. They could be parabola. A parabola, as all people who study the conic sections will know, is just an extremely elongated ellipse with the two foci moved apart, 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 apart forever. But forever is a long distance, so only move apart a thousandfold the orbit of the Earth, you get a very long ellipse, which is a comet that will take many hundreds of years to come back again, you'll never recognize it. But Halley picked just the right one, Halley's Comet, which takes 70 or 80 years. We've all been through one passage of it, or most of us, some two and very few none, and uh, that'll be interesting. And it'll come back, pretty sure it's come back 30 or 40 recognizable times. But this thing is even more important, because this precession is very closely related to the ice ages. I don't want to elaborate on that, but it simply shows what small things can do in the context of much repetition of long, cha long time change in the conditions of nature. The ice ages are held largely to be caused by the variation in the obliquity of the Earth's axis, the eccentricity of its orbit, and the precession of its major axis, because that affects the way that the distance to the Sun beats against the tilt of the Earth's axis toward the Sun. In our time, in this hemisphere, we are closest to the Sun in the winter time, which is, it's only a half percent effect, you, uh, it's, it's more, it's about a three percent effect. You don't notice that much, the Sun is a little bigger, but everything else is so gloomy that you don't notice that small change. <laughs> But if that repeats for thousands and thousands of years and then goes the other way for another 20,000 years, something will happen. And most people believe that that is the principal source of the coming of ice, which is only a small change in the whole planet. I just mentioned that to show this kind of effect which went across the Newtonian uh, concern. So these details, these fine details, are what interested most people for hundreds of years because of the completeness and finality of the beautiful discussion of the solar system that the law of gravitation and the elaborate calculational schemes 
due to people like Laplace, Lagrange, Hamilton, the whole 19th century of calculators were able to show that small changes in the jiggling around the planets were realized, they could be checked, they were genuine, and they all followed the Newtonian rule, except probably many will remember one effect that is so small it's hard to observe on the Earth, it's a very small part of that total precession. But in Mercury, it's a much larger part. And there it was well known to be an anomaly. Nobody could calculate a cause for it. Many times it was suggested that another planet interior to Mercury must be present, big enough to make its orbit move not quite concordantly with the best and much repeated calculations. That was never found. It was tried, many people thought they saw it, but no verifiable find was ever made. And in 1916, Einstein, with the first substantial and even conceptual modification to Newton's theory, showed that his theory quite naturally led to this uh, amount of discrepancy. Slightly different, essentially because for Newton and for everyday life, we think of mass as being one with matter. But Newton recognized, I'm sorry, Einstein recognized that energy too had mass, the famous formula, and that meant that the mass of the sun is not all at the sun, but is due to its gravitational field, a small amount is outside. And this plus the V over C, the changing velocity of Mercury in its orbit, is enough to make a very good fit, and in present day terms, within 1% of this tiny correction to the orbit of Mercury. And that was sort of the, the entry of general relativity into our world. Very small detail away from Newton. You could absolutely ignore it, if not for this possibility that it might lead you to put the whole thing in another language and see something quite remarkable, which indeed has happened, which I'll come to at the end of my talk. But the fine details are not unimportant. They are fascinating, and that's why I wanted to mention them. Now, we can do more. We can, it can exploit this multi-particle effect very nicely in the following way. And it was done. It was done by us taxpayers. I don't know if we exactly knew it, but uh, we did, and it was a good thing, and I think it will be monumentally appreciated for many hundreds of years to come. Here's what it is. We launched from Earth in uh, two vehicles about at the same time, I believe in 72, uh, from Earth, two voyagers, and we arranged them at least one of them, to carry out this mission, which was often called the Grand Tour. But uh, deference to the uh, playful, to the uh, fancied opposition of the Congress of the United States to such playful terms as Tour and Grand Tour, to which the taxpayers were playing plenty of money, uh, led uh, NASA to suppress that term. I don't know. Uh, but anyhow, there's Earth orbit to scale, Jupiter to scale, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And the graph shows you plus two years it took the probe to go from Earth to Jupiter, plus four years to go to Saturn, nine years to go to Uranus, 11 years to go to Neptune. It made it all that way. At each point it came close to the planet, the reason which I'll explain in just a moment. And it went out of the planet and was also went underneath the planet and was drew, drawn up into, above the plane, and it's still there after all this time, long beyond the five or eight year design limit, still not fully functioning, but functioning well enough so we still know where it is, and maybe in a pinch could command some action by this thing, which is the furthest out thing of which we have had any kind of connection. It's quite an interesting result. Now I'd like to show an animated cartoon which will do two things. It'll make this picture a little more realistic, because it will show you the great difference in space and in time which is present in the solar system. And let's see if this gives us, yes. Here's a, a really just an animated cartoon, but all to scale in both time and space. So it means it's uncomfortably fast to begin with and uncomfortably slow to end with. Can't be helped, that's the way the system is built. The big red ball flying around so fast is Mars. Earth is the one inside, soon Earth will give rise to the Voyager, which will go behind the planets and be pooled, and one after another comes right behind them and is pooled, and finally pushed way out in the solar system by the last planet, Neptune. Maybe it'll show again why I talk about it a little bit. 
What is interesting is this. In this context, do not think that you don't probably, that Voyager smashes in, literally into the surface of Jupiter. Not at all. We know what that looks like. It doesn't look like this. It skims by. It orbits. But it orbits a thing which is enormously more massive than itself. If you ask, where is the center of mass between the one ton probe and the 10 to the 20th ton planet, it's a joke. Right? It, the planet is not disturbed at all. The planet keeps moving, and therefore the little object orbits when it's close to the planet. It doesn't feel the sun at all, except in respect to the planet's feeling the sun. And so it makes a nice orbit, which is never touching the planet, must come in and go out with the same speed, because there's no energy lost in this gravitational orbit. The sh in airless space, there's no energy lost as you orbit. And therefore it comes out the same speed with respect to the planet. But the planet is moving in its orbit very fast, much faster than the probe. And therefore, when the probe makes the collision, if it's carefully done, if the geometry is chosen, so it swings just behind the planet, the planet will pull it forward and give to it, it turns out, twice the orbital velocity of the planet. It's like throwing a baseball or a rubber ball against a brick wall. It bounces off nicely. If you throw it against a brick wall moving towards you, it bounces off with increased vigor. And that's exactly what happens here. So the people were able to exploit the motion of the planets, the natural reservoir of energy in the planets, of, to give energy to the probes that they couldn't afford to build into the engines and send them out with very modest fuel far out of the solar system. A remarkable feat and a very nice one and, and quite impressive. I hasten to say to those who are interested in conserving the kinetic energy of the solar system that it really doesn't make very much difference whether you send another probe there or not. There are plenty of things in space that are a thousand million, a million million, a billion million times the mass of the probes which are going by all the time, as we well know. And let me show a little bit more of that. This object is a meteorite. It's about uh, 10 or 12 inches. It looks like basalt with some white patches. It was found in Antarctica, where it had been delivered by the slow flow of the glaciers from a long ago fall and it weighs about 15 or 20 pounds. What is remarkable about it, it belongs to a set of meteorites, fewer than a dozen, known in all the collections in the world. And they're very similar in chemistry and, geo and, and mineralogy and in gas content. And none of them match any other meteorite. And they all match the best measurements we have from the surface of the planet Mars. And the opinion is now overwhelming that this object is a piece of the planet Mars. It turns out that the Grand Tour was not invented by some clever engineer in NASA. It was reinvented by that person. It was invented long ago, and the shuffle's been going on for a long time. How can that be? Well, we all understand how it could be. It takes a little detail, and people wouldn't believe this chain of events until they were forced to believe it. And the, the thing is, of course, many objects fly. Sometimes they strike. When they strike, especially an airless body like the moon or like Mars, almost airless, not Venus or Earth, much less likely because the air takes away their velocity coming in and going out. When they strike an airless body, they strike with full orbital, orbital velocity, in fact, enhanced by the pool of the planet at the last moment. And when they strike, they make a big crater. If they're big objects, they make a huge crater. In a huge crater, much rock is disturbed. A great shock is set loose in the material. And at the very edge of the shock, the material that is compressed by the shock is free to move. It isn't compressed anymore. It's flung out because it has no overburden no overburden to hold it in. In the bottom, of course, it's just compressed. And we find this compressed rock in all our craters. But at the very edges, there'll be some region always where the pressure is not increased very much, but is turned, the pressure of the shock wave is turned into motion. The thing is free to move because there's no heavy 10-foot burden of rock outside. So the last surface of rock can be given a big fling into the into orbit. And it's been calculated that indeed this will happen on many occasions. Most of what's flung off a planet will come back again and strike it, but some will not. 
and some will be re-encountered, will go so far away as to be, feel a mixture of the sun's force and the planet's force, and therefore no longer will have a simple orbit, and it will come back to be a, a quite different um, orbit. Oh, thank you. No, I shouldn't have done that. All right. It will come back in a different orbit, and therefore will be hit sometimes so as to make a collision with the Earth, with the planet from which it came, and that'll be the end of it, a real collision where it has contact. But sometimes it will be lucky and not make a contact collision, but only an orbiting collision, but get again the velocity of the planet added to it, and that will send it out into space. And that must happen. If millions of pieces are tried, a few will get this. And that seems to be what has sent this group of meteorites called the Shergati group uh, to Earth. Uh, the evidence is the basaltic nature, the crystallography, the mineralogy of the basalt crystals, which look like long slowing, long slow cooling, and the gas content, which is like that found in the atmosphere of Mars and not any other place. And the same thing is true for moon rocks. The first moon rocks were not brought, brought back by the asteroid, by the astronauts, they were meteorites. And they exist in many museums, and we can verify that pretty well. I would say this is uh, 95 or 98 percent certain. We've not seen it happen, but it's pretty well verified. The number is not too small to believe, and I think we have to accept it. Quite a remarkable state of affairs. So I would say there's a natural counterpart to the grand tour. Maybe we could call it the solar system shuffle. And uh, it brings materials between the planets. And if you want to uh, reckon on artifacts and life, you're free to do so. I don't know how often it will happen. Now, of course, still more remarkable encounters happen, and this is familiar to us all from last year, a remarkable time. And there it is, a Hubble Space Telescope picture. Notice the line saying eastward of a, what was called a string of pearls that was found. These little objects are the fragments of a comet. Shoemaker-Levy 9, which apparently broke into many pieces. We've seen comets do that before. But mostly we've seen that happen near the sun. Now this comet, when it did that, was not at all near the sun. It was quite far from the sun, but it was near the planet Jupiter. In fact, so near that it was easy to show that soon it was very likely not only to be broken apart. Why was it broken apart? Perhaps you have a feeling for that now. If you think of a planet approaching, I mean of a comet approaching a massive planetary body, it feels a gravitational force. Now if that gravitational force were perfectly uniform on all parts of the body, it would simply bring the body crushing in, crashing in. But it never can be uniform, because the nearer part of the body must be a little closer than the farthest part of the body, and that means that the pool on the nearer end will be greater than that on the far end or on the center, and the a tendency will be to stretch the thing out in the direction of its fall. And if it's weak, and if the planet is big enough, and if enough time is available in the orbit for this to happen, it'll break into pieces. And that happens at the sun, and it happened in this case in Jupiter. And you know what the consequences were? The orbit would no longer be the same as controlled by the uh, one fall. Only the center of mass would now continue on the nice ellipse that would miss Jupiter, but the rest of it would not. And here's what happened. As everybody, I think, knows, that's the outcome. A year later, the first picture was July 93. The second picture was July 20, was July 22nd, 94, with several great big red spots the size of the Earth in the surface of the planet Jupiter, where the 20 fragments of Shoemaker-Levy 9 struck one after another in those wonderful days when at least all the amateur astronomers and their professional counterparts were watching TV and, and robbing the internet of every picture that might possibly uh, be related to the subject. I think an even more interesting picture in my context, though not one which was in TV very much, is this one, which I owe to uh, Dr. Yeomans at JPL, who made the wonderful calculations. Now this skein of yarn is, believe it or not, the orbit of fragment K of the comet, extrapolated back to before the comet broke up. 
Now it's a bit uncertain, but it won't be very wrong, and nobody cares about the details. It's the scale of yarn effect that is so, so interesting. Because now you see what happens to a comet which is close to Jupiter in some parts of its orbit, but far from Jupiter in some others. Notice the scale. I've drawn 5.2 astronomical units. Jupiter's 5.2 AU from the Sun. That's a good long way, five times our distance. The scale of this picture is about three tenths of an AU to the, from, to the bottom from the center and to the top from the center. So the comet moves three tenths of an AU away from Jupiter, and the Sun is only five AU away. Well, that's not very big, it's 1 15th, but the Sun weighs 1,000, 2,000 times more. And in the outer part of these orbits, the Sun's force, I have reckoned, is maybe a fifth of the force which the comet feels, and four fifths of the force of Jupiter. So the orbit is a kind of a strange mixture. It is not a two-body force. It is not an ellipse anymore. It is local an ellipse, but the rosetting which I talked about is now really like a skein of yarn, a very complicated motion indeed. And you see what has happened to the simplicity of the Keplerian rules and their Newtonian counterparts when you come to different physical conditions for starting the situation off. And that's the big lesson of this. It's the same Newtonian gravitation. It's the same planets. It's the same general domain of speed. It's the same general domain of distance. It's the way the pieces are put on the checkerboard before you start running the calculation that makes it work this way. And it's this enormous variety contained in these simple descriptions of nature, like inverse square law of gravitation, that is what it really is my, my major topic. Of course you recognize that this is a kind of prelude to the idea of chaos so important in our time. I want to show you the simplest and oldest demonstration of what is now fashionable to call chaos. This is the three-body problem, as it is called, in a familiar and simple version, uh, first uh, written up by Poincaré at the turn of the 1900s. Another great time in history of science with x-rays, relativity, uh, the birth of quantum theory and the Poincaré mechanics. Here we see the red spot of the sun. Here we see the orbit of the planet Earth around it, or any planet. And here we see uh, an imaginary object, a comet, let me call it a probe. I want to think of it as very small, orbiting in a very long ellipse. And let the whole thing start like my animated cartoon. Can you see it in your mind's eye? The sun, of course, will stay still. The planet will move in a beautiful, smooth, practically uniform circle. And this thing will move in a long orbit, which will take more or less the same time, twice as long or one and a half times as long as the, as the big planets. But let me imagine the, the probe is so small, it doesn't affect the other two. But of course, they can affect it, no doubt of that. So you start the whole thing going, and what will happen? Well, it's dull as dishwater. The planet will go round and round and round and round, and the comet will go round and round and round and round, and nothing will happen. And maybe careful measurements with you know, good micrometers like uh, they did in the 17th, 18th century, you'd see there'd be some small variation in the Earth. Uh, do, I don't think so, because I said the probe was too small, too light. But there'll certainly be some variations in the probe. But that's all, just an almanac kind of story. The way we used to think of Newtonian mechanics, it just improved the last decimal point in the almanac. Well, the last decimal point took a long time to work out here. But one fine day, I don't know which day, and you'll have a very hard time finding out, even measuring the system very carefully. One fine day, it'll happen that the Earth is on that orbit, its orbit, right near the very point where the probe passes the orbit. Bound to happen someday, right? If they're in sync, it'll happen every time, and the thing will never get formed. If they're just a little bit off sync, it doesn't matter how far, it'll take quite a while to pick it up. And when it picks it up, though, watch out. Because what's going to happen? If the planet is on one side of the probe's orbit, it'll hold the probe back and won't go out as far as it did. It'll start falling in towards the sun and make a different funny orbit and be one of these skeins of yarn that we saw all tied up inside the Earth's orbit. But if the planet's on the other side of the probe's orbit and the probe crosses behind it, what's going to happen? We saw it happen before. It's going to be shot clean out of the system to infinity. We'll never see it again. And so you have this terrible situation, completely predictable almanac, and then one fine day, because they left out this term, it's missing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is now fashionable to call chaos. I don't like the term, as you see, 
but uh, it's uh, fair, to, I don't, I'm not complaining. And the, the interesting, however, to point out was very well understood and it's physically quite easy to understand. It's not a mystery. It's the result of the kind of thing we're talking about. The nonlinearity of these relationships when the laws of symmetry are not enough to constrain it, like energy and angular momentum, to constrain the orbit to an ellipse, then you get all kinds of wonderful things happening. And they can be predicted, but they can't be predicted with infinite accuracy because you need such fine detail. Because whether it's on one side of the planet of the probe orbit or not is a tiny detail, like the two, two orbits coming together. The end of my orbit, it will certainly be very hard to get that straight. And you'll have a very hard time doing it accurately enough. And Poincaré proved it could not be done for all time. The mathematics forbade that kind of calculation. There was always an intrinsic error. And that's essentially the beginning of the whole idea of chaos. And what Poincaré could not do, he had no computer, his life was too short to calculate the elaborate calculations, produce those skeins of yarn like Mr. Yeomans can do with his wonderful computers. He just couldn't do that. He knew it was going to be a complicated orbit, that's what he said, but he wasn't going to spend his life trying to find all those points by hand calculation with pencil and paper, or even with a fancy machine driven by hand, a calculator. So nowadays they do that wonderfully, and that's what chaos theory has done, and has shown many interesting regularities about the thing, but the fundamental idea is still here, can be understood, it's not mysterious, it's just what happens if you come too close in a world where the force law is such that it gets stronger and stronger and stronger as you come together. Of course, if you came to the very center, you would have infinite force that's prevented because the very center is the center of material. You collide before that, and the whole situation is a different situation. But it's nice to see it in that form. So that's the, the straight uh, account of it, and it gives a very interesting uh, context for the view that even Newtonian mechanics with its simplicity and its smoothness was not uh, exempt from this kind of drama. Fortunately, and all those dull books which just improved the last decimal point, they were not wrong, they were brilliantly carrying out the right methods, but they had chosen initial conditions that were so tame that they never got any spectacular result, just a few seconds in the eclipse. Why had they chosen those conditions? Because they fitted the observations. Why did they fit the observations? It's clear. If there had been any wayward probes wandering around or comets or whatnot, what would have happened to them? In the course of time, they'd been thrown out. And therefore, the system was purified. It was circularized. It was flattened. It was, it was purged of all these uh, intruders. And it was quite simple. Of course, not all, right? All is a bad mistake. Nothing happens all. Plenty of comets left. The comets for the ancients were omens. And they're omens for astronomers who couldn't understand where they came from. They came in. They don't last. They're temporary. And they come and go and come and go from a great pool that must be far away, named after Professor Urt, who had these ideas very clearly. And that's the way it stands. And there's no way around that, I think. So we do have this sense of chaotic behavior. And now I want to jump in scale, having set up the, the groundwork to jump in scale to the galaxies. Because, of course, our century is a century of galaxies. They were hinted at, even in, even in uh, a little later than Newton's time, a little later than Bach's time, by Kant himself, the late 18th century philosopher. And he had a good idea, and he was right. Other Milky Ways, he said, will exist, and we've seen them. And he looked at the very poor images of those telescopes without photography, just by drawing, and said, these images are what the Milky Way would look like if you lived, in it, if you lived outside of it and saw it from a distance. He was quite right about that. But nobody believed it for a long, long time. And of course, there were plenty of arguments against it. How could it be so big, et cetera, et cetera. But indeed, it was right. So I just run through familiar pictures of galaxies. This is a nice spiral galaxy in the, in the near distance of 5 million light years away. Here's a, oh dear, sorry, wrong button. Here's one. Uh, uh, 50 million light years away in the Virgo cluster, we now see a whole cluster of galaxies, a Virgo cluster of galaxies. See, the, they're not stars, their shapes show they're not stars. Each one, as you know, is uh, 10 or 100 or 1,000 billion stars, and their whole systems of stars comparable to the Milky Way, which is a characteristic one, typical one. And here's the same situation, but just give you a feeling of the awe, which, which I think it brings to me, is these blue spots, and most of the yellow spots are also galaxies. 
but they're seen in a very deep plate, exposed for 24 hours in a very dark sky in a very big telescope with very sensitive technique. And the number of galaxies, this is a tiny small part of the sky, smaller than one hundredth part of the moon, the area of the moon. It has plenty of distant galaxies in it. All we know about those galaxies, they appear once in that picture, that's it. Anything more you want to know about them, you've got to take the picture yourself. There's nothing more to be said. But they're very faint. But if you count up how many there are in the sky, and imagine that was a fair sample, and people have taken 100 to get fair samples, you find there are 20 billion, enough for five whole galaxies per person, or thereabouts. And in fact, I would say probably more. I would say it goes 10 times that, so feel easy. Take six or eight if you like. And uh, there'll be plenty to go around. But galaxies, of course, are not always those beautiful spirals and beautiful ellipticals that we've seen in the pictures so much. And of course, the fascinating part is something they look like this. That's a terrifying galaxy to look at. I have to tell you that that ring, it's called the cartwheel galaxy. And the rim of the cartwheel is made of a collection of new stars, all the same, all blue, with plenty of supernovae among them. That's why it's so bright and conspicuous on the picture. And if you look closely inside the spokes of the cartwheel is a normal spiral galaxy, more or less twice the size of the Milky Way. The Milky Way would fit comfortably inside that cartwheel. And the center of the cartwheel looks yellowish. It's the infrared superposition showing the duller stars that abound or are so close together they merge into one. They're not one. It's a huge cluster of stars, again, like the bulge in our galaxy, but it looks like one. And one of these two strange galaxies nearby and I have to say, I think it must be both of them. I hate to say that. But the reason I say that is one of them is very strange because it has bright blue stars in it. That's the irregular one below. And one of them is very strange because it has no bright blue stars in it. That's the one up above. It looks to me as though both of them are disturbed. I don't quite see that would happen. But the general view is this thing, one of these two, or maybe both, have come right through the center of that other galaxy when it was normal, when it had no rim of hot stars. It was just dying out at the edge like an, like an ordinary respectable galaxy and it was struck. And in the, res in the result was to cause a ripple in the stars by gravitation alone, cause the stars to move outward and the gas to follow them. And the gas became compressed in this motion. It was supersonic. At the outside, it shocked and began to form stars in that high density region. The stars formed, we don't know exactly how, we know a good deal about it. And it made stars which are all young stars and many of them become supernova and make still more explosions and so it goes. So you get this exciting thing. Why do we believe such a preposterous thing? Because the physicists are pretty clever and have convinced us <laughs> by, the, by, the following, by the following scheme. This is a computer calculation done quite a few years ago by some very good people in the business. My colleague, Tom Ray at uh, MIT was one of them. And I marked with a green spot the thing they've shown here. They started with a model galaxy. Now, it wasn't a very good model. Instead of uh, 100 billion stars, it had 500 stars. But you know, it's the best we can do. So it had 500 stars, make them go in circles the way the stars do in the galaxy. And it had the speeds right and so on. And it threw a small galaxy right through the center. You see the small galaxy on the drawing. And only gravity plays a role, but the gravity, inverse square gravity, certain mass, certain star, certain motion, certain force, changes the motion. Okay, that affects the next star, the next star, the next star, the next, and so on. All carefully done with a computer. And after a while, look what you get. Go down the circle as it happens, and there it is at the end. It looks an awful lot like the cartwheel, though it didn't have the extra process of multiplying stars as it goes. When you add that, you make it not just denser there, but also much bluer and brighter. And since we see that, it's a terribly strong argument. This is really what happens. So everywhere we see collisions of galaxies, as well as comets on Jupiter, as well as meteorites on the Earth, as well as uh, probes passing the planets, uh, etc. So it's, uh, it, it's very striking for the unity of nature. And now I think we have another video. Oh, I'm sorry. Another example called the antennae. You can see why. Those are two galaxies, rather overexposed. But what are those terrific antennae coming out of them? It's a beetle or something. Well, it isn't. It's each one's the size of the Milky Way. And each of those arc of stars would turn out to be stars with plenty of hot gas, the usual sign. And they go way out into space like eyebrows or antennae. I would have called it, I guess, the eyebrows, but they call it the antennae. And there it is. And they've figured, they've made a simulation of that as well. And I'll show you the simulation. 
So this is from a supercomputer in Pittsburgh, and you'll see it's the work of Joshua Barnes, a very good calculator at the University of Hawaii. It's a modern one, so it's in color. Equal mass stellar disks, 50,000 stars, not 500, much better detail. Josh Barnes, University of Hawaii, kindly lent this to me. And first we'll see the setup. Two, two galaxies to throw against the other, they're the same. And now you just let them rotate. This is not any real motion, just looking at it from a different point of view. This is just the stage effect. So you see what you're looking at. Flat disks that are in that configuration. Okay? Now there's the trajectory. You let them go around each other in the famous parabola. Why a parabola? Because they're too fast to be caught completely by the other by gravitation alone. So they just make a parabola around each other. And now we see the evolution. Watch for the collision. Wow. And look at the eyebrows or antennae. Characteristic effect of tidal action, just like pulling apart the planet, the comet that hit Jupiter. And there you see it. And now we'll stop it again, and they'll look, let you look at a rotation of the different forms, because we don't know which way to look at it in the sky, right? Nobody tells us how the antenna are turned in the sky. We have to try various ones to make it match, and they did. It's quite an impressive event. By the way, it takes about a quarter of a billion years for a galaxy to go around once. You saw it go around several times as it made this picture. This is not a sudden collision. This is a long-lasting collision, which lasts much longer than the dinosaurs and everything else. It lasts much longer than we do. It lasts uh, a good fraction of the age of the sun. Now here we'll see a direct disk. They change the way the disk spins just to give you a little bit of different experience and throw the object through it again. They left off the other part just to make it simpler. And there you see this similar kind of, but now a much wider spread because they made it spin differently. If they come with opposite spin, they mix up. If they come with the same spin, they help each other. And of course, a lot of this is being done. It's very hard to do. But here's different inclination. So this was not straight on, but on the side. We expect to get some asymmetry. And sure enough, we do. So people study these wonderful pictures. And from this way, we form a real opinion of what the whole thing will look like. Here's the thing evolving in time. Now I hasten to say that this is matched in scale to the Milky Way. It's in time, of course, it's very rapid on the picture and very slow in real life. It's only a simulation in the computer, and that's how it works. This is a sort of a messy one, and I think maybe that's almost the end. Well, not yet. This is a show it looks like from different directions. Again, we just see the same object, not moving, but just turning in our point of view. So we say, oh, there was the great eyebrow, went way over there. Good heavens, we saw something like that, we wouldn't believe it. Scratch on the plate. <laughs> so you see that gravity is capable of the most protean behavior. It just doesn't have to stick to the almanac. It does all kinds of explosive and difficult things. And I think maybe that's the end.